this week or, or this message is not uh, a real easy one. And the reason is because, well, delivering is not easy, difficult, but the preparing for the conviction. Anytime you preach a, a message about the godly Christian or anything like that, people look at you and think, oh, he must be the godly Christian because he's putting this message, giving this message out. And believe me, that's not me. I mean, we try, we, you know, we try and we grow. And, um, but this week I've been convicted tremendously about my, my walk. And my goal today is to pass that pain on to you. First Timothy, the final chapter in this book next week, uh, we start our series on the I am's of Jesus. And we're going to go through the seven different times Jesus said, I am talking about I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, and so on and so forth. Uh, really looking forward to that. Today, we're going to cover the entire chapter. We're not going to, I'm not going to read the entire chapter. We're going to cu- hit, hit on a couple of different ways. We're going to start out by reading it, but then we're going to settle on um, some action words, some verbs that Paul uses to describe what is this godly life that he's calling us too. The key theme or a key theme in the book of Timothy is that of godliness. The fact that godliness is central to our Christian walk. Now, I, as I said, this week I was really convicted uh, going through this. But this morning when I was sitting back there singing the song that God is with us, God said, God kind of spoke to me and said, yeah, Lee, you were convicted. I want more from you, but I love you. I'm with you regardless. You are mine. And so I want to let you know that we mess up. We don't live up to what we want ourselves to live to. But you know what? God still has us. God is still wanting to be with us always. So in the book of 1 Timothy, the term for godliness is mentioned 10 times. Four of those are in this chapter here. So chapter six is kind of like his crescendo, his final thing. You know, this is it, Timothy. As I was saying, there's nothing more convicting and humbling than studying about being a godly Christian. Uh, This has been difficult, as I said, very challenging. Indeed, personal godliness or Christ-infused godliness, as we, we could say, is not only indispensable to our faithfulness, but it's absolutely essential to our sharing the gospel with others. It's absolutely essential to us sharing the gospel to others. If Faith's parents saw her uh, being angry with Rick all the time, then what kind of testimony would she have to be able to share the gospel with her parents? Our faithfulness, our godliness is imperative to our testimony and our witness here. Godliness is the only way we as Christians can have joy in this life. It's the only way we can have true contentment in this life. If you find yourself antsy, if you find yourself not satisfied as a Christian, check out whether you're truly, fully devoted. Because it's only in walking with the Lord that we Christians find joy and peace and contentment. This paragraph, I mean, this chapter outlines fairly simply into four parts. Uh, Verses one and two is godly life and service. And do you see there I've kind of broke up the second one, threats to godly living, uh, three to five and nine and ten. And then godly living is six to eight and eleven to nineteen. And then finally, Timothy's charge. And we're going to read through part of it, and then, like I said, we're going to look at some specific uh, action words. Um, in this chapter, uh, he, he looks at godly living. Now, let me say this. Godly life is a proactive life. Or you can say God, the godly life is an active life. Godly life is not you sitting back and waiting for the Spirit to fill you. It's not you going to some cave and 
having this amazing experience with God for the sake of having an experience with God. The ascetics of the second century would thought that was the way to be have a godly life is that you would separate yourself from the world into some monastery and that's how you would have your godly life but it's not like that we don't sit around and meditate alone in some cave in order to have a godly life to be godly we must be proactive we must think ahead we must do things uh, when god speaks of the godly life i mean when paul speaks of the godly life he uses words like flee, like pursue, words like fight. Those do not appear to be passive verbs to me. They don't describe someone who is not engaged and who is just waiting to be filled with the Spirit. Rather, it sounds more like someone who's doing battle, doing a spiritual battle, fighting for their life. So that's that's what's, what's at stake in godly life, godliness. It's fighting for your life as a Christian. So, But before we dive into reading scripture, if you'd pray with me. Father God, I do praise you and I thank you for this opportunity, another opportunity to, to study into your word, to, to learn, to grow, to be convicted, um, and hopefully to change. Uh, speak through your word today, Lord. I, I do pray that as Barnabas uh, prayed that I would be less and you would be more, that your word would be central, that our hearts and our minds would be convicted and changed because of your word today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things. Paul starts chapter 6 with a discussion about service as bond servants. Some, some Bibles translate that as slave. Um, it can be translated as slave, it can be translated as bond servant, or just simply servant. Um, we can legitimately apply this to the idea of employment today. The word doulos, which is there, is just talking about one who's under authority um, and um, uh, on a, in a general sense. In those days, slavery was a part of the economy. It wasn't like what we think of as a um, horrible American slavery. It was still bad, but it wasn't like that. It was kind of like if if I went, they didn't have bankruptcy, right? So if I totally owed you money and I could not pay you back, I could sell myself to you as your slave into a bond servant. Uh, if it's a way to pay off debts and stuff like that, yeah, there was abuse and everything. But the idea is just this general idea of, of authority. That's what Paul is getting at here. And in, in the NASB, he says, teach these principles. Teach these principles. So he's, he's talking about a principle here that he's trying to teach. So like I said, in our set, setting, we can easily apply this to any position where we're serving under someone else's authority. So we can talk in terms of the, the boss worker relationship or in terms of the professor student relationship or the coach player relationship in any of those relationships this um this still applies anything where one person has authority over the other however the actual focus of this verse is not that relationship it's the relationship of your authority and how they see god and you, it's your responsibility to honor them so that they have a good view of your God. Why do you submit under these authorities? Why, do you, why are you the good worker as a Christian? It's not so that you, your reputation is, grows. It's not so that your testimony will be good, so that people look at you, oh, he's a nice guy. It's so that your boss doesn't think badly about your God. 
or his teachings, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Just showing honor to your supervisor and the effect it has on the view, on his view of God that you serve and the doctrine you live, that is the crux of these two verses. We are to serve with honor, even if it is in a difficult situation, as if we're serving the Lord. The reason is not, like I said, not so that we look good, it's so that your boss doesn't revile the name of God. Very interesting word, revile. You know what that word is in Greek? I bet you know what this what other word we translate this mostly to. The Greek word is blasphemeo. Blaspheme. So if we read it using the most common translation, we're to honor our the authorities over us so that they don't blaspheme our God on account of us. Paul in Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. How do you live a godly life in service? We serve as to honor our boss. We serve so that we can honor our boss. Our goal is not to make the best widgets. Our goal is to make the best widgets so our boss is honored so that when he looks at us and he knows we're a Christian, he can honor our God. Uh, we're to work hard. Now, obviously, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But as we do, if we keep that perspective that we're working for God, for his uh, honor, and we're honoring our authority, the authorities over us, then that'll have a direct effect on how they see our God. Paul continues to say that if by chance your supervisor, your boss is a Christian, don't slack off. We may have a tendency to do that. Oh, our te- our, we're brothers. He's going to let me, you know, he can let me take this day off. You know, he's going to let me get away with some things or what or she i keep saying he but i mean he or she um don't do that because the person paul's argument is because the person who you're benefiting is a brother you should work all the more because they're a brother in christ work hard because it's a believer and a brother or sister who is benefiting from your work we talk about having a good testimony but we can't forget that it's not really about us, right? It's not really about our testimony. The focus is not on us. It's about his, the testimony for him. Our focus as godly men and women is for God to have a good reputation through us, because of us. It, is, it takes me putting up with, if, I mean, if it takes me putting up with difficulty, a uh, difficult boss, inconvenience, or even suffering for the sake of protecting his name and doctrine from being maligned or from being blasphemed because of my behavior, then bear up under that load. You're bearing up under that load for Christ, not for the sake of your boss. So if I can summarize this first point of how to be godly in a life of service, It's this, the godly life in service is the obedient, reverent life of doing your best work for the sake of your God. So as not to leave any space at all for your supervisor to besmirch or blaspheme God or his teachings because of you. So first, that's the first step in being a godly person. It's a godly Christian is Honoring the authorities over you. Work hard. Show honor to the people over you because God placed them there. And you want them to have a positive view of you, your God. Work unto the Lord in whatever circumstances you might find yourself in. We know Paul found himself in some really difficult circumstances, even unto death at some points. Yet he says, I was content. I was happy in all of it. So first point, 
Next point is, what's, what are some threats to the godly life? Paul returns to this warning that he first gave us in chapter 1. In fact, we're going to read that chapter 1, and you're going to see it almost, it's, he almost parallels. The greatest threat to our church, to any Christian church today, is false teaching. The greatest threat to the church is false teaching. Paul is living not too many years after Jesus died, right? He's, he's still within the first century. Yet, he's the, the number one threat he sees in the church is the distortion of Scripture, the distortion of the gospel. And we're 2,000 years out, and it, it, there's been some major distortion of the scriptures. So, so let's read. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Imagining that godliness is a means of great gain. That's verses 3 to 5, and we're going to jump forward to verses 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I want to point out a couple of things here. One, notice that uh, this uh, section is misquoted quite a bit. Uh, it says that the, we often hear that love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, all evil. But actually what Paul is saying is the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. There are many roots, many things that bring evil into your life. Money is one of those. Secondly, these people have wandered away from the faith. That's a hard one because he doesn't clearly explain if he's talking about people who were toying with the faith but not quite Christians and they've been pulled away like the, the, the weeds in the road have choked off the gospel in their life, which is a very a valid interpretation of what he's saying. Or is it uh, someone who is a Christian who has been drawn off by money and they've, they're off the, the path and they're um, they're in a state of 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 backsliding, which is a miserable place to be, by the way, isn't it? The most miserable person I believe in this world is the person who is a true born again Christian who is who is rebelling against God. The Holy Spirit has a way of convicting you. That makes you the most miserable person in the world until you come back. I really believe that. That's he, he calls you back constantly. Anyway, that could be these people. And if that sounds familiar, it should, because previously in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, certain persons, by swerving from these, the things that make for a godly life, have wandered away into vain discussions desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they are they make confident assertions. When I, I was in a summer mission uh, in inner city LA, we were working with a, uh, a church, uh, T.D. Jake's church down there. He wasn't around. We didn't get to meet him. We were kind of depressed, but uh, we were working with this church, and we talked to one of the associate pastors, and we asked him, we had a question and answer thing. We said, What's the, what is the greatest thing your church struggles with? And without much thought, he said, it's 
it's young Christians running off and wanting to start their own kingdom. They men, these men, inner city men, they get a little teaching. They become Christians. They get a little teaching and they run off and they want to start their own church, their own little kingdom. They think they know what they don't know. And so it's important that we study and we grow how to identify false teachers. First of all, Paul says they're proud and puffed up. You see the cat, he's looking in the mirror and he thinks he's more than what he is. He thinks he's a lion. These men are like this. They're puffed up with conceit. They think they know. They think they know the truth. They think they have a corner on their truth. This could be actually the start of a uh, uh, one of the heresies that was going on in the second century, which was called Gnosticism. Gnosticism were People thought that they had like this special knowledge and the way to be a Christian was you had to have this special knowledge. And this could have been the start of that. Well, these people, Paul says, the result of this pride is that they understand nothing. They truly don't understand anything. They're so proud that they refuse to entertain any alternatives to their own teachings. One quote is, says that you can't learn anything until you're humble enough to realize that there's something that you need to learn. You can't learn anything unless you're humble enough to understand that there's something you need to learn. So these people are proud and they don't know anything because they're too proud to learn anything new. They think they have a corner on it. Stay away from those people. Stay away from those people. These people are, they love to argue. They have this, Paul says, an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarreling about words. You know these people. They're people who argue, will argue about anything. I used, to, I used to be a part of, for a short time, an organization called IFCA, Independent Fundamental Churches of America. But they actually were more widely known as I'll fight Christians anywhere because they thought they had a corner on doctrine of Jesus Christ, of, of Christianity. And anything that didn't agree with them, of course, they condemned. We need to learn the truth. We need to constantly train in the truth uh, using through the word of God and studying. But when it comes to arguing for the truth, we need to tread lightly. We need to tread lightly. Nobody, nobody has entered the kingdom because of a good argument. Your arguing does nothing but divide. And these, test, these false teachers love to argue. We have some false teachers out there who are arguing for, for all kinds of, 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 of fine points. Some, some of them are very good points that we should discuss. But understand, look, there are so many issues out there that there's, there's good people on both sides of the issue. And if you're a a solid, godly Christian, you understand that. There are people who don't agree with my interpretation of this. And there's people who have a different interpretation of this. And their arguments or their um, reasons are just as valid as my reasons. We cannot convince them and they cannot convince us. But you know what? We're not arguing over whether or not Jesus is deity. Or Jesus is the son of God. We're arguing over things that no matter if you believe this or believe this. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're still going to heaven. So why is it something that we need to fight about? It's not. But these teachers, if you go to YouTube, there's lots of you know debates. You'll see John Lennox debating uh, Hitchens. You'll see you know uh, Christians debating atheists. And you think, That's good because it's not arguing. It's actually an organized debate. And the purpose of that organized debate is for the onlooking, onlookers to learn and to grow. The purpose of an argument is for me to win you to my side. So if you see someone who is overly combatant with teachings, then beware. If it's a teaching that is popular or, for example, like uh, speaking in tongues or... um, or how do you handle the, the 
the idea of slavery. That's something that, that's here. Um, it's not something we need to fight about. It's something that we need to, sure, reason over, but let's not fight about it. Let's not stand so strong on our on our thing. Oh, another another one that has divided the church is this idea of free will versus sovereign the sovereign will of God. That's a huge one. I know what I believe. And of course, I think I'm right. Only God knows actually exactly how it works out. I'm going to, it's going to be awesome to be in heaven and to say, oh, wow, I was like really wrong in that area. We were both wrong. It's actually this. There are many Christians who believe various things. As long as we agree on the essentials. If a pastor or teacher finds joy in driving home a point that's not found a foundational truth of the gospel, beware. Stay away from them. And it's important because, it's, as we're going to see later, the, uh, as we've talked about, he conf- they confuse people's minds so much, they become deprived of the truth. They can't even know, they don't even know what the truth is anymore because their minds have been so twisted by these, by these teachers. So what's the next one? The next one is that hurts that how you're going to identify false teacher is they're focused on money. They think the gospel is a way of gain of make to make money. And honestly, a corrupt person could make a lot of money in this business. We see that, right? We see pastors all over the world making a lot of money. If you get Let's say if you just get 100, per, 100 people to give $20 a month, that's, I mean, a week, sorry, that's $2,000 a week for standing up here and talking. And and if you get your congregation up as big as like one particular pastor has, he's got a congregation, let me make sure I get the number right, of 45,000 attendees. 45,000 attendees is the biggest church in America. He has a budget of $89 million a year. $89 million. This is from the from uh, the 2017. This is 2017. $89 million a year. But the saddest thing is on that same financial statement that I looked at, only 1% of that money goes to mission work. One percent. Everything else goes to uh, building, production uh, of his TV, production of, uh, of his Sunday morning productions, production in his TV, um, uh, various various foods. Var- I mean, he's he spends it on his kingdom, basically. Basically, Paul says that people have wandered away from the faith because of. Money. This is not to say, well, I, I've talked about that already. But money is a great way for Satan to make you useless in the battle for the kingdom. It's just a root of evil. There are other things Satan uses, but money is a great way for him to take pick you up and take you out of the battle. So beware of these people who talk about health, I mean, about wealth of, of being a Christian. These are three. There's one more, and it's probably the biggest way to identify false teachers. And that is from their fruit. Their fruit is rotten. One final indicator for false teachers, and this is a big one, is the main reason we must avoid these false teachers is that their fruit of their teaching is rotten. Verse 4, Paul says, the fruit of their teaching is they cause envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction uh, among people who are depraved in mind. Why are they depraved in mind? Because they're deprived of the truth. See, the reason you need to stay away from false teachers is because your godliness will disappear. As he leads you astray to focus on comfort, to focus on food, 
uh, on money, on cars, on wealth, they'll lead you astray. And your mind won't even be able to understand the truth anymore. All right. So let's move on. Paul is, is like, but wait, wait. I'm sure he's like, there are people who are rich. I don't want to disparage them. And so he says, but godliness with contentment is great. I'm sorry, this is after this. He, he has a little section where he says that, uh, where he says, instruct the rich. If you're rich and you're a believer, be generous. Okay. But here, what he's saying is that these people say that godliness is great gain because I can make money through it. But Paul says, you know, you're right. Godliness is great gain, but if it's, in, if it's with contentment, meaning you're not going after money. It's godliness and contentment become the great game. For we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of this world, but we have food and clothing. And with these, we are, must be, we will be content. It's kind of a play on words um, where, where he says godliness and money is great gain? No. God and contentment is great gain. Contentment is being content with whatever we have, whatever God has given us. The key ingredient, of course, is God. You got to have a God. God is there. If, if you have God, you have clothes, you have food, you're good. We have to be content with that. Paul was saying, I've learned how to be content. With when I'm filled or when I have nothing. God, let us get to that point in our life to be content no matter what you, you give us. All right, so that's what we need to avoid. So now Paul turns to uh, a charge of what the godly person looks like. Um, so godly living, here's the verbs he uses when he talks about godly living. Flee, pursue, fight, take hold, keep, charge them, guard, avoid. It's all action. It's all actions. Paul says in verse 11, flee. He says, but for, as for you, O man of God, flee these things. What are we talking about? The things that the false teachers uh, produced. Pride, arguing, the desire for riches, contentiousness. Basically, all those things that Paul has mentioned, flee, run away from them. The godly Christian avoids these things as much as possible. If you have a problem with money, do something about it and change your mindset. It's hard. We prayed, my, my wife and I, we pray all the time, as many of you, I'm sure, pray, Lord, give us enough that we don't have to beg but not so much that we don't rely on you. It's hard when you don't have any money. I understand that. It really is. Students, I, I, I get you. I understand. Um, but you know what? God has all the money everywhere. God cares for us so much. And he will take care of us. So first of all, God, he says, flee. The next one, he says, pursue. Verse 11, he says, pursue. This, these are the biggies. Pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, lo uh, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Pursue these things. This is what godliness is. How do we pursue these things? Well, through scripture, through study. We renew our minds through the washing of the word. You should be constantly in the word. How do you live a godly life? Biggest thing is the word. Get your mind in the word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Besides that, seek godly people to learn from. Get involved with a small group uh, that's focused on spiritual growth. <laughs> Come to church. Have someone in your life who will challenge you in your walk with God. The godly Christian pursues godly character. A godly Christian pursues godly character. We don't sit back and hope it will happen one day. We pursue. You make it a key in your life. Instead of pursuing likes, 
for entertainment on your phone, why don't you stop doing that and start reading scripture or going through um, testimonies or watching sermons, right? That was my, one of my big convictions. I've, I've caught myself this week and I felt like throwing my phone across the room. I really did because I was studying and I went, okay, I need to look that up on, in scripture. And before I'm, I'm just scrolling through these little short videos and I'm like, what in the world? And so I actually got up, put my phone on the other side of the room, <laughs> came back and sat down. How, how maddening I'm studying. I'm, I'm supposed to be teaching these people about godliness and I'm like getting so distracted. It's not good. So we need to pursue godly character. And that's what we're talking about. Then Paul says, if not if pursuing is not enough, he says, fight. Fight the good fight of faith. But wait, I thought we're Christians. We're not supposed to argue or fight. Well, he's saying fight the good fight of faith. That is, do things that prove your faith. And avoid temptations that weaken your daily walk of faith. Avoid scrolling. That weakens your walk of faith. It's so hard, but avoid it. Develop disciplines or spiritual habits. Have a set time where you read your Bible. Uh, pray daily and all the time. Go through your, your day with God by your side. Lord, how do I handle this particular situation? Oh, wow, God, look at the sunset. That's so beautiful. <laughs> what a gorgeous flower. God, that's such a good flower. That's beautiful. He's your buddy. I mean, that's not a good way to say it, but he's, he's your companion always. Holy Spirit is with you all the time. Understand that. And when you're talking to him always like that, it gets in your brain that, hey, God, I'm with God always. Okay. And I don't mean to say he's your buddy. He's not your buddy. He's, he's your friend. He calls you a friend. Even that drives me crazy. He's your God and he's with you. So he loves you. The godly Christian fights for their faith. Godly Christian fights for their faith. He says, take hold. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Take possession of it. Um, make it yours. We pray as we're our, our, our kids graduate high school and move on that they've made their faith theirs. It's not their mom and dad's faith, but they've personalized it. They've, they've actually made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ themselves. But in this case, he's talking about that faith that you made a good profession for. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, meaning figure out what it is and how you're supposed to be living. Figure out what God wants you to do. Work at it. It's not meant to be easy. It's not meant to for God to say, oh, I'm a Christian. And then God says, this is what I want you to do. Go do it. He says, yes, sir. And then you just go. No, it's, he wants you to work hard at figuring out what you're to do as a Christian. Because he wants you to seek him over and over in scripture. It's seek God. Seek him. Seek God righteousness he wants your your single focus to be him and it's so hard it's so hard to as as believe as people with flesh and skin and and living in a world of sin it's so hard not to be distracted keep verse 14 he says keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our lord jesus whenever you see in the new testament the word commandments don't think the 10 commandments don't think the law Oop, yeah what i think is what i think is you shall love your lord your god with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind that is the greatest commandment so when god says keep my commandments think i should love my the lord my god with all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my mind. And I should love my neighbor as myself. 
That pretty much encompasses all commandments. Keep the commandment to love God, love others. Focus on that. And you'll be a godly Christian. Godly Christians keep God's commands. Charge them. Paul tells Timothy, charge them. Charge, uh, oh, here's the rich part. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Oh, I'm so rich. I'm better than you. Nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. You know how much money people have lost in the market? Just my, I have friends who've lost thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars in the market. Not, I'm not like that. I don't have that much money, but they do. I mean, they've been packing away money for a long time. My wife's father, he lost everything in the market crash in 2008, right? I think it was. Um, don't put your hope in that, but put your hope on God. Who he richly, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy they are uh they are the rich are to do good to be rich in good works to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what is truly life wealth itself is not the problem it's your attitude towards wealth it's your attitude towards money. The godly Christian that is rich is a genuinely and joyfully generous Christian. I'm going to jump through really quick because I have a slide at the end I want to get. So he says, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Basically, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, you've been entrusted with this ministry. Guard it. Protect it. There can be false teachers trying to draw people away and, and mess up your ministry. Guard your ministry. We all have a ministry. Guard it. Protect it. The godly Christian protects the ministry that God has given them. And then Paul, he says, Timothy, avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved away from the faith. There's another swerving away from the faith this is this so-called knowledge is nothing but irreverent gibberish and those who get too caught up in this gibberish may possibly veer off the straight and narrow path so be careful we conservatives love to to, to dump on so the social ills of the day we will spend hours talking about how bad it is in this country or that country, how, how awful that is. But you know what? We need to keep our mind off of that because that's not our business. Our business is the gospel. It's a fight for true faith. Do you want to be a godly Christian? The godly Christian stays away from idle talk. Godly Christian stays focused on the gospel. The struggle to live a godly life is real. It's a lifetime of fleeing, and it's a lifetime of pursuing. Living a godly life is a constant struggle. It's all, you've heard this before on many different situations. It's about the struggle. Godly life is about the struggle. It's not about making it. You'll never make it until, you know, this side of heaven. It's about the struggle. So struggle well. Struggle well. There are four things that will kill your godly living. And I want to just quickly go through these four things. First one, chasing men or chasing women. Chasing a relationship that is not God will kill your walk with God. Because if I'm chasing a girl, then I'm not chasing God. If I'm chasing God, then you know what? I'm going to draw unto myself the kind of girl that I want to get. Girls who are attracted to people who love God. So don't chase girls, and girls don't chase men, men and women. Be careful of that. It's, 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 it's blessed to be married because you don't have to worry about that. Secondly, stop chasing entertainment. Stop chasing entertainment. I love movies. I love TV shows. I love entertainment. 
My whole goal in life before I was a Christian was to work a nine to five job so I can party on the weekends. That was my entire goal for my life before becoming a Christian. I struggle with this. I want to have a, I want to enjoy myself. I want to have a good time. I want to go out and have fun, which is not bad until it becomes bad. Until it becomes everything you think about. What are we going to do tonight? What kind of fun can we have tonight? Not, oh, I want to, I, I haven't read my Bible. I want to focus on, my, I'm on scripture. I want to focus on God. Okay. Stay away from, like we talked about, scrolling, TikTok, Instagram, WeChat moments, and on and on and on. They're just, they're just exponentially expanding the number of things that will distract you from life. They're a trap. They are a trap. And their, their entire purpose, think of this, the entire purpose of getting me to do this is to make other people rich. The entire purpose of me scrolling is to make other people rich. Stop making pagans rich. The, the next thing is chasing money. We've talked significant, we've talked a lot about chasing money. Chasing money just tells God that I don't trust you with my chasing money just tells God I don't trust you with my future. I need security and money. God always told Israel, don't run to Egypt. They will not protect you. I am your God. Don't run to money for your security. It will not protect you. It will disappear. God is your protector. God is your security. And then finally, stop chasing significance. Stop chasing significance. I have, I have 200 likes. I have 10 likes. I, I got 20 likes just in the last five minutes. Doesn't matter. Does not matter what this much in the kingdom of, not even that much in the kingdom of heaven. Who really cares? Your significance is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, you have no significance except to be used as a pawn on this earth to help his people. Do you think, think about that? This earth is here because God put it here. We are here because God put us here. You're a Christian because God loves you. He will do anything it takes to draw you closer to him. His focus is on you. If you're not a Christian, then you're a pawn and a tool that God's using to help Christians grow. And he wants you. He wants you to be one of those Christians. He wants you. He draws you. But if you're not a Christian, then your significance, there's no significance. Because the only true significance is eternal. The only true significance is eternal. And I'm... It, it, my significance is in my God. That is why I, I feel so bad when I catch myself scrolling or I catch myself doing stupid things like that. Because my significance is there. Not here. Do things that matter there. Do things that matter there. Not here. So how to be a, a godly life, a godly Christian? Focus on him. With every ounce of your body, try to focus on him. Yeah, we get distracted. Yeah, we, we fail. Yeah, we stumble. But get back up. Fight the good fight. Strive to know him better every day. Strive to walk with him every day. And, and know your scriptures. Know the word. If we up here say anything that you're like, hmm, challenge us on it. Because the authority is not us. The authority is scripture. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that we can be godly Christians. Thank you that when we fall and we stumble and we fall down, you bend down and you pick us up. And you just brush us off and tell us to keep going. And Father, thank you that we know you're always with us. Lord God, we, we pray for anyone who doesn't know you. Uh, I, I pray, Lord, that you would convict their hearts and their souls at this moment. Show them that 
that, that they don't know you truly and draw them to yourself, Lord. Father, us who do know you, I pray that you would convict us of our shortcomings. Help us to continually fight the f- good fight of faith in order to, to uh, kill the old man, to kill the old ways, and to replace those with your ways. Uh, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.